welcome back to the channel. Today we are picking up on the same document uh, we left off with, which is the many motions in limine, which are arguments to exclude evidence on the basis that they are more prejudicial than probative, or they might be irrelevant, or some other argument, uh, many other arguments in this case as to why they should not be in a trial. I am the Black Belt Barrister, helping you to understand law, and I sincerely thank you for joining me once again on this channel. Um, just a, before we get started, brief brief shout-outs, I promise, to our new channel. I say our uh, Mr. Alan Robertshaw and my new channel, which is Art and Media Law by Black Belt Barrister and Alan Robertshaw. And indeed, I've been plugging my dear wife's channel, Easy Chinese Cooking. Um, if you want to uh, know how to cook very delicious food, please jump over there. The link is in the description below. So without further ado, um, let's move back to this document now. So we left off uh, with uh, Tracy Jacobs evidence, um, which was a motion in limine to um, exclude uh, this deposition. Um, because Amber Heard had tried to introduce the deposition of Dra uh, Tracy Jacobs in other unrelated jurisdiction um, litigation between different parties from years ago. As if that didn't sound uh, strange enough as it was, there, there are yet more uh, motions in limine. I, again, as I said, I promised that I will break them up into small uh, chunks so that you're not here for many hours per video. You've got time to watch each one of these. Moving on to the next one. The next uh, motion in limine was where the um, action sought to exclude what was effectively Amber Heard uh, trying to introduce uh, discovery throughout the course of the proceedings from other litigation involving Johnny Depp. So essentially what this was is Amber Heard's lawyers trying to um, extend their discovery process, discovery uh, remember being the the process by which trying to find out what other material might go against another party's case or support their case um, in in england and wales uh, we call this a process of disclosure disclosure of documents and inspection of documents inspection being actually looking at those documents disclosure being providing a list of exactly what documents you have and broadly speaking, you split that into various uh, categories, those things that you have in your control that they, they can see, those you might have in your control that they can't see for various reasons, might be privileged and so on, like a legal advice, and uh, so on and so forth. Some documents might be in the possession of somebody else and you simply cannot um, you cannot uh, pr produce them because you don't have control of them. So this uh, motion in limine was to um, prevent some of the discovery process from other litigation. Now, this was litigation involving Johnny Depp, but not this this case. So uh, those litigations, there's A, B, C, and D. So at the very least, four uh, different litigations. And one of those um, overlaps with the arguments made about alleged um, violence towards other people uh, by Johnny Depp. Um, and essentially, all that was was a, a claim that was in progress uh, which has since been settled now. Uh, you may recall I did a video on that. That has been settled. And again, many people will jump to the conclusion or ride on the conclusion that that must mean that it was true and that it all happened. And that is very much not always the case. Many, uh, litiga many a litigation is settled because it's easier, quicker, cheaper to just settle it than to actually go through to trial. Uh, most of the time, if not all of the time, um, that is on a no admissions basis. There might be a confidential annex of agreement and settlement and so on. In England and Wales, we call that a Tomlin order to bring to a close a litigation. And behind it, there is a confidential annex of um, things that you've agreed to between the parties. For example, it might include an apology, um, maybe a public apology, maybe even a private apology. Sometimes we've had a private apology as part of the um, confidential schedule to a Tomlin order, which brings to an end the litigation. So that's one of those cases which we'll come on to now. So um, just very briefly, the first case here was um, Johnny Depp and uh, Mandel. So in, in the Superior Court uh, of the state of California, uh, this case involved allegations against his former mal managers of 17 years for negligence, breach of, breach of fiduciary duty, other claims, and stemming part of the managers spending millions of dollars without permission. Um, it was fiercely litigated involving complex 
uh, legal and factual disputes in relation to the management of his finances over a de uh, period of uh, two decades. Now, clearly, there will be arguments which I'll, I'll touch briefly on um, in a moment. This is the summary of um, what these issues were, and this was one of those cases. Straight away, I can tell you that this is not going to be relevant. It's going to be um, entirely outside of the remit of the instant case, i.e. the Depp Heard case in Virginia. So it's entirely outside of that remit. Um, but there will be arguments which I'll touch on in just a moment because um, obviously this whole argument goes through those as well. The second case I'm talking about here, um, Johnny Depp and uh, Bloom. And it, again in the Superior, Superior Court, uh, this case involved allegations against his former entertainment uh, attorney of 17 years. So against his previous at entertainment attorney of 17 years uh, for breach of uh, fiduciary duty, malpractice violations, etc. So I should make clear that in talking about any of these cases, I'm not commenting as to what happened in those litigations, how it was decided, whether those were founded. This is simply the reference to those cases in this argument, which sought to restrict, curtail uh, the discovery process by Amber Heard's lawyers into this case, the instant case in Virginia. The next, the third one um, is this one I talked about, um, the alleged uh, aggression towards other parties. This was the Greg Brooks case, um, which, as I said, has subsequently settled. And um, as I say, draw no conclusions on the fact that it settled other than the fact that it had settled. Um, this involved allegations by Brooks that he would punched him in the ribs and so on and so forth. Um, the fourth case here um, Eugene and Johnny Depp uh, gained Superior Court. Uh, this case involved a claim by two of his former bodyguards, brought a suit alleging that he'd failed to comply with various provisions of the Labour Code and so on and so forth. So, and that case settled as well. Um, so, again, I would say for each of these, not relevant outside of the scope of the instant case and shouldn't be... Um, shouldn't be coming near it really because other cases happen people have other cases and um they, they they shouldn't really be any anywhere near this case so um as we say here argument um and as i said these are the arguments that will underpin um why this should be curtailed and restricted and indeed as i just said um the very first thing that pops up here is precisely what i said mr depp's prior litigations are not relevant and this is a big key in law because um, for something to be in a court case, it has to be relevant to be introduced in the first place. Clearly, if it is entirely irrelevant, not only is it going to be or, or very likely to be prejudicial, but it doesn't serve any purpose. It wastes time, costs and everything else. And in England and Wales, we have what we call the overriding objective, which is to deal with a case um, with it, you know, justly at a proportionate cost, bearing in mind the party's relevant situations and financial situations, but ultimately dealing with cases expeditiously and at a proportionate time and cost measure. And clearly, if you are dealing with every issue under the sun, which is not relevant to the case, not only do you go off on tangents and uh, risk prejudice in the case, either either with the judge, because if a judge were to see a whole list of other things that are entirely irrelevant, then even the judge might be led to believe, consciously or otherwise, that um, one party is right or wrong, as the case might be, based on that, what is, in effect, irrelevant information. But certainly a jury is, is I would suggest, much very much more susceptible to that because um, a judge we trust will uh, draw lines between um, what is relevant um, and and not be uh, prejudiced by that material a jury uh, with respect to the jury we, we we cannot just automatically trust that a jury will draw those lines uh, and not be swayed by it so the very first point as i said um, is that these are not relevant so um, first, the other litigations are, and it's a strong emphasis here, there's there's not often an emphasis in legal documents, but we do see quite a few of them in here, uh, totally irrelevant to the claims and the issues in the present action and should be excluded on that basis alone. And there is a supporting code uh, for that as well. Uh, very often in legal documents, you will see that we put various codes here and um, 
clearly this is um, code from the Virgin, uh, Virginia Superior Court. But in England and Wales, uh, we may use uh, case law, possibly a lot more common law. Um, but certainly there might be procedural rules as well. And there, indeed there are with even uh, with civil evidence, uh, certainly with criminal evidence, but certainly with uh, at the very least with civil evidence, there are codes to um, prevent irrelevant uh, evidence coming in. Indeed, it is obvious that evidence of a party's uh, prior lawsuits would generally be irrelevant and in inadmissible since that it has no reasonable tendency to make a material fact more or less likely to be true. In other words, they're irrelevant and inadmissible because just because something happened before or was argued before, it makes no material impact on the instant case at all. There is no reason to suggest that anything that happened before in previous litigation is going to uh, sway this instant litigation at all. <clears throat> the present defamation action involves allegations um, between the parties. That is the core of the case. Uh, not malfeasance by him, his managers, or his forum, former attorneys. Um, th there's obviously more in there. You can go to read that. The second argument is, again, as we've said before, more prejudicial than probative. So this idea that something is more prejudicial, as I say, more likely to sway a party wrongly to a conclusion than probative. Probative meaning going into the details of a case and looking up um, to, to determine the truth and the fact of an issue within the case as against something that's outside of the case. So judging a case on its own merits, on the merits of the evidence before you that is relevant and either underpins or uh, contradicts the, uh, the claim in the instant case, as against something that happened outside of the scope, either in time or in relevance, parties, uh, and, and so on. So prejudicial versus probative. Um, again, one of the strong arguments in this case that um, many of these things, indeed a lot of these things, are, were argued to be more prejudicial than probative. To the extent these litigations have any relevance at the present action, the probative value is substantially outweighed uh, by the danger of unfair prejudice. And there is yet a third argument. The other litigation should be excluded as improper character evidence. So this uh, bears a little bit of an explanation as well. Uh, we have mentioned it before on this channel. Um, character evidence is essentially going either towards or against a character's um, believability, credibility. And so if evidence is introduced that makes you likely to think that it's a bad person, um, that is what we would refer to as bad character evidence. Uh, everyone is deemed to be a person of good character, uh, although you you get a confirmation from the judge that they will direct that the person is of good character. But certainly with bad character, it, it is with the judge's approval that bad character is directed and accepted um, based on evidence. So um, this argument here, ultimately that it is it should be excluded as improper character evidence um, this the Brooks case in this case will be highly prejudicial as improper character evidence the reason for that is if the jury were told about the Brooks case that's the um, allegation against Johnny Depp that he was punched uh, and so on um, if that were explained in full detail to the jury what that claim was, bearing in mind there was no determination at that point, it was simply an allegation, I could get somebody uh, write to me and accuse me of doing something to them with no basis, no merit whatsoever. But if I were in another litigation and this were brought to the jury's attention, the jury might then draw the conclusion, well... Clearly, it's much more likely that I did whatever this thing is because there's another case ongoing. Now, there is something to be said that if there are, you know, 20, 30, 40 people coming forward all saying the same thing, then that, and it's exactly the same subject matter, that is one argument. Um, but here, um, there was obviously no determination and um, 
in entirely different circumstances. So this was shown to be, um, or argued to be, this was a highly prejudicial and improper character evidence. And so those were the arguments for that one. And so this was the other litigation. Um, it gets even more outrageous, um, in my view, with the arguments about uh, Johnny Depp's spending habits. So yet another motion in limine uh, to exclude and restrict uh, evidence. This one was for precluding Amber Heard from referencing or introducing evidence about his spending habits and loans. Now, remembering what this case was about in the first place, this was a defamation case. This was a, about an article that um, Amber had uh, been involved in and put her name to and Johnny Depp was saying that this was uh, defamatory of him and obviously her counterclaim um, which was successful in part uh, was ac accusing him of um, broadly similar allegations in defamation um, but then drawing the uh, distinction here clearly um, his spending habits and loans should not be taken I mean this this off the surface of it sounds um, you know with respect to the the parties that try to argue this in uh, it sounds a little bit silly um, but as it says here uh, Miss Heard sought extensive discovery into uh, Johnny Depp's uh, finances spending habits and loans and in that deposition uh, examined aspects of a cross complaint uh, by Mandel's company against uh, Mr Depp on various different things um, it goes on to say this this type uh, of pointless financial discovery goes on and on Miss Heard also asked about loans that he'd purportedly received uh, to avert this crisis caused by his spending. Uh, and again, I just say that it is completely irrelevant. And in fact, the argument was summed up here very succinctly and very quickly. And actually, I can see it as I'm reading down it. Um, totally irrelevant. Uh, what, I've, what I've done for this video is looked up the arguments and then um, discussing my views on it and then coming to what the arguments were put forward. And as I said, here, as I was just about to say before I saw it on the screen emphasized, totally irrelevant in this case. His spending habits were totally irrelevant. I cannot see any possible argument that they were relevant. Um, what does his spending have to do with uh, a, a defamation case? Now, his earnings, clearly that was relevant because um, the argument of loss of earnings and, and actual harm and damage caused by the defamation uh, is... Um, is a separate issue. His spending habits, not so much. Um, so those were yet further arguments, uh, motions in limine uh, against evidence to be brought in. The next is equally interesting. This, uh, if you recall, um, in relation to uh, Miss Manson, Marilyn Manson, who was the subject of public allegations, very public allegations of abuse that made headlines. Now, again, this just, well, as this shows here, an approach uh, reflects, to, approach to the trial reflects a blatant intention to smear him uh, under guilt by association. And again, um, just bringing another name in and essentially trying to smear them both with the same brush. And says here, there is no reason uh, to lob such ridiculous allegations into the case except to smear him by association. And again, there are extensive arguments that go on with this. Um, moving quickly on, um, this one, um, very interesting, about uh, an expert brought in by Herd's lawyers to essentially attack the police officers. Um I won't go through this in great detail, but ultimately um, attacking the um, the police officers um, following or not following of procedures and remembering, of course, that they were witnesses to a lack of injury and a lack of damage. But there were extensive arguments and even introducing or trying to introduce a witness, uh, an expert witness as to um, the police involvement. So those arguments are through there as well. And uh, again, just very briefly with those headlines, um, whether or not the police followed the procedure is irrelevant to the issues in the case. And indeed, of course, their evidence stood on its own anyway. And 
Again, the evidence is unfairly prejudicial and likely to mislead or confuse the jury. And indeed, um, the opinion of this expert invades the province of the jury. And in other words, the jury should be left to determine the quality of the police evidence by themselves, not be told by someone else what the quality of their the, the evidence was. Um, last but not least, certainly not least, um, the argument against uh, Ellen Barkins. Now, this one is, is quite remarkable. Um, the deposition of third party witness Ellen Barkin was taken uh, on November the 22nd and Miss Heard designated portions of the depositions as evidence in this action. And essentially Barkin had testified that um, she and Johnny Depp were in a brief intimate relationship around three decades ago. Three decades ago. And testified that although he was verbally abusive to others, but not to her, she never witnessed him physically attack anyone and was never physically abusive towards her. And so nonetheless, this was um, brought or attempted to be brought into this case as evidence. And this motion in limine was to uh, argue against it and to uh, and to prevent it coming in. And the arguments there, again, relatively robust arguments. First of all, that it's inadmissible. There is a code to support that in which clearly this should just not be brought in. Secondly, again, that it's improper character evidence, which we've just, just discussed before. And again, as we've discussed before, it's more prejudicial than probative. Now, finally, for this video, not finally or together, you can tell by the page numbers. This is page 148 of 424 of this document alone. But finally, for this video to not uh, make it too long so that you've got um, bite-sized videos to go through. In this video, um, you may recall uh, Dr. Spiegel. Now, this was to exclude, this argument was to exclude his opinions on Johnny Depp's mental condition without ever examining him. Now, if you ever recall my uh, collaboration with uh, Dr. Shaham Das, who is a consultant forensic psychiatrist, I will put the link in the description below. If I forget, somebody please remind me because I always forget. Um, we had a lengthy discussion over experts and what um, an expert should or shouldn't do and comment and shouldn't comment, in particularly in, in respect of other people. Um, one of those, um, straight away, uh, I'm thinking as I read this, is that an expert should not be commenting on the mental condition of someone who they have not had the opportunity to examine. It's an aff And it, this goes on even before we get to there. Um, it is an affront to two orders of this court. Now, this bears the emphasis, which is why this is the final one that I'd like to talk to you about on this video. The court has denied Ms. Hurd's request for an IME of Mr. Depp, not once but twice, specifically concluding that his mental condition is not an issue and that the parties are not similarly situated. Moreover, Dr. Spiegel's anticipated testimony is utterly without foundation, meaning there's nothing to back it up, irrelevant, meaning it's not relevant to the case, and could only serve to confuse or mislead the jury, which means it's prejudicial as opposed to probative. With a scientifically useless testimony, scientifically useless, it argues most likely because he did not have the opportunity to examine him, which is, again, something we'll come back to in just a moment. Uh, Miss Heard nonetheless designated his uh, to him rather um, as an expert to testify about uh, Depp's mental health, even though he's never met him, nor conducted any sort of examination or personal evaluation of Mr. Depp. Um, see um, Amber's third supplemental and rebuttal disclosure of expert witnesses, so on and so on. Um, so on to the arguments. First of all, it's irrelevant. So. Precisely, you might think it's irrelevant uh, as to what he thinks about Johnny Depp's mental health. Um, and on that basis alone, it should be excluded. Indeed, twice the court denied the request and uh, has not put Depp's mental health in issue in this case. And here, quite an emphasis. I am. I might have expected an emphasis here. Ignoring the court's clear ruling on this issue designated him to testify essentially about his mental health. Um, next argument, 
that it lacks foundation and violates professional ethics and standards. Again, this is because he hasn't had the opportunity to examine him and seeking to give, as it, there is emphasis here where I might expect it, seeking to opine about uh, Depp's mental condition despite the fact he's never even met him nor conducted any mental examination or testing on Mr. Depp. So, uh, next argument, um, that it inv again invades the, uh, the province of the jury. So, the jury should be allowed to come to their own conclusion and not have somebody that hasn't examined him um, tell the jury what they should think about him. And then finally, the sort of very broad argument that it is more prejudicial than probative. So those were the next set of arguments I thought you might find particularly interesting uh, to hear some views on and some overviews. These documents are, of course, unsealed and everybody uh has the opportunity to see these documents and again just to emphasize that i i feel it necessary to talk about these issues because these are the legal arguments that go behind such a long-winded embroiled case such as this some people in the comments say this was over weeks ago this trial yes it was but now that you can see what went behind it and the difficulties that people have behind it my hope is that just by talking about it, you get some free guidance and assistance on how to understand and interpret these things so that if you are ever involved in it, you have a better idea of how to deal with it. Cannot be taken as legal advice. Of course, it can't and it cannot replace formal legal advice, but I hope that it is useful nonetheless. And uh, either way, hopefully it uh, gives you some interest in the case and understanding how this works. That is, of course the black belt floof uh, barking because someone's coming to the gate she's also linked in the description below please go and check her out as well but in the meantime thank you so very much for watching and thank you for your time mm -hmm.